Oops. Hold on. A little perch. It's interesting if you, um, as a brother Hunter was talking about America in Hebrew, um, uh, Israel, how they call uh, America, actually you translate it, America is actually the land of the covenants. That's how it's actually the literal translation. But uh, America does need a sense of humility and repentance big time in Jesus' name instead of... Uh, the spirit of Nimrod that waves their fist at God in defiance towards him. Amen. So I would ask again to continue to pray for Pastor O and Pastor Robin, and they shall be coming back, but we do wish them well while they are gone, as well as Pastor Eleanor and Mr. Ostervain, and I always appreciate an opportunity to bring forth the word to everybody. And I always do like confirmation, and I praise God I can't, my wife's not here. For those who are here on Sunday, I thank God for my wife. She gave a fantastic word, and I was really blessed. And you'll do a lot of, there we go, hallelujah. So I did get some confirmation, and I wanted to kind of piggyback up what she was saying. And then for those, maybe even a few weeks back, if you can remember, I had an opportunity to lead communion service, and part of the message was based upon this idea of inheritance. Okay? Everybody say inheritance. Inheritance. According to Hebrews 9.15, it states that we have the promise of an eternal inheritance. An inheritance in one sense means a passing down of legal property at the owner's death to the heir of those that are legally entitled to receive it. Now for those that are more interested and more teachy, this is what it will be. It will be more exhortative in nature. And if you don't know what that means, well, we'll find out shortly. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord God, for your sweet presence, God. Lord, we don't have to ask for you to be here because you said you'd never leave, leave us or forsake us. You said that you would never abandon us or leave us orphans. So, Lord, we know that you are in the midst. And, Lord, when you are in the midst, Lord God, the miraculous and the extraordinary happen. So, Father, we do bless you. We praise you, God. And Father, we just pray, Father, that, uh, Lord, as the word goes forth, Father, that it would prosper, Lord God, in the, the soil of the hearts of the people, God, where it would grow and that it would flourish, Lord God, producing 30, 60, 100, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, when we talk about inheritance, we have to talk about the concept of covenant. Covenant is probably, I would say, probably one of the most, if not the most important term in the Bible. Inheritance and covenant are kind of inextricably woven together as one. Now, covenant um, is really... Let's see, how can we make it? Because covenant's a difficult word. Con a covenant is different from a contract, but it is kind of like a contract. In insurance terms or legal terminology, a covenant, or excuse me, a covenant is kind of like a contract of adhesion. A contract of adhesion is a unilateral agreement in which one party is in a stronger position, kind of lays out the terms and conditions of how the legality of things is going to run. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's the same thing when you're talking about uh, an inheritance. First, you have to have a will before you have an inheritance. Okay. Now, a will is established to spell out specifically what are the terms and conditions of it. Okay. Now, as the heir and receiver of an inheritance, you cannot unilaterally change the terms of it. You're really at the will of the will. Oh, it's kind of interesting, a double entendre. Anyhow, so it doesn't matter what you think, what you feel. It's the person, the benefactor who wrote it up. You have to kind of submit to what those terms are if you want to receive the benefits of what it has. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you want to receive and tap into the blessings, when now we're talking about, I'm not talking about an inheritance from a standpoint, I'm talking within the Christian standpoint, we're talking about inheritance, then you need to follow the dictates of the will and testament. Now the Bible says in Romans 8.17 that we are joint heirs with Christ. Now an heir is a person who inherits or is entitled to inherit rank, title, and position. So when Christ died, the will 
that was set before the very foundations of the earth. It was triggered, and we, the saints of God, are the glorious recipients of that inheritance. Thank you, God. At least somebody got excited about that. We have a rightful and legal claim to receive and walk in everything that Christ has and designated for us to steward, manage, and use. Now you're thinking, what does that include? What is Christ's inheritance? And we will kind of unwrap that like a Christmas present. What does really Christ own is the question. Well, the Bible tells us very plainly. Psalm 24, 1, it says that the earth and the fullness thereof is his. Psalm 89, 11, the heavens are yours, the earth is yours, the world and all it contains. So being in covenant with Christ and having relationship with him, because remember, covenant is, is to know God. Uh, you talk in the New Testament about, like, know the truth and it shall set you free. You have to be intimately acquainted with Christ at a very deep level. As Adam knew Eve, that term is yada, and that's the sexual intimacy. That's how God, take away the, the sexuality part of it, but that's how he wants to know us. But we have a claim to these things. We're big in America about, well, I have a right to this and I've got a right to that. But you really don't have a... In the kingdom you have, you have very few rights. In the kingdom you have the right to be called the son and daughter of God and you have a right to an inheritance. Now when I speak about inheritance, I'm not speaking exclusively of money, but obviously that is a part of it or real estate, or some earthly possession, really that's kind of too small and too common for uncommon people. So that's not really what I'm talking about. We have to expand our thinking if we can ever comprehend and grasp what the vastness we have in the inheritance in Christ. Now another part in co-equal importance in the meaning of inheritance, and these words are very foreign to us probably, but maybe if we were in an 18th century United Kingdom, they would make more sense. Inheritance is also meaning the concept of legacy, say legacy, legacy. Birthright, birthright, and heritage. So not only is there a legal transfer of goods and possessions and a disposition of real or personal property, but we're also left to establish a godly lineage whereby we understand and represent what it means to have supernatural status of being called a son and daughter of the Most High God. Now, I believe that not having a revelatory heart knowledge of our birthright hinders our ability to manifest the inheritance of Christ. We have a head knowledge that I'm a son and daughter of God, but this gap of about eight inches seems to be the real kicker. It's like having the logos of something instead of the rhema. You have the word of God. Okay, whatever. You have the Word of God, the Bible. The, the Bible was at one point a rhema word. A rhema word is something fresh from God that he speaks. So at some time when the Bible was being put together, it was God-breathed, it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, I believe, that it was God-breathed. That means it was a rhema word to those that were the scribes of what he was saying. I'm not talking automatic writing. and We're not getting into New Age weird crap here. But through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were getting rhema word for God to write it down. Now we have the written word. Now it becomes a more, it's a, a logo. It's a, um, excuse me, it's more of a logos thing. Where it's not a fresh word per se, unless under the power of like the sprinkling of the Holy Spirit, words do come alive, but more of it's a written revelation. Do you understand between, okay, between rhema and logos? Okay. And this is what I'm talking about. You need to have a rhema word, not that you are a son and daughter of God, that you're entitled to, that you have a birthright that's royalty, that your DNA has been supernaturally changed, and that you have an inheritance in Christ, not just up in here, but you need to have it in here. That's a big difference, especially those people that are very logical, very Bob Duco, very intellectual, very rational, very coherent in their thinking. They have a hard time here. But that's what changes When I was inquiring of the Lord recently about the manifestation of the power of God, I have one of my, I guess we, I don't know if this is just the guy thing, but my life verse is 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not in word or talk, but it's in power. Amen. That's mine. So I asked God, I said, God, I'm not really super satisfied at the level of manifesting the power and love of God. 
And he said, one of my issues is that I am results-oriented. Now, God is very interested in the process as opposed to the results. Does everybody know that? Okay. We're worried about getting an A on the test. He's more concerned about our studying, meditating, getting to the point where we can get an A on the test. Okay. God said, I cannot feed and validate your results-minded thinking. When you are results-minded thinking, you are performance trying to earn certain results. Yeah, that's what I said. I want, even though you want a good thing, the way I'm going about it, my mindset that I have to earn it, that I so desire this end result is actually performance Christianity, which isn't Christianity, but it's really pagan. So he can't feed into that type of thing. God loves me and he loves you because he is love. And your birthright, your inheritance, entitles you the right to be called a son and daughter. Is not earned, but it is privilege that is passed from your new birth. You were in Adam. You were sinful. As my brother said, you could not not sin before you're a Christian. Now, according to Romans 6, you are freed from sin. So when you are in Christ, the last Adam... That's the privilege that comes with it. It's a divine privilege. It is your birth and recreation from darkness into his glorious light. You cannot gain nor merit your birthright. He gives it to you once you are born again and in covenant with him. That's the key in covenant with him. Not one night stand, not occasionally hooking up on the weekend, not when it's convenient for you, not because you need a bunch of stuff, but covenant, yada, intimacy, really close, which we won't get too graphic because, hallelujah, we'll keep it PG. You can't even see PG-13 because PG-13 is, they got some stuff. PG-13 is like R or even some, hallelujah. There's a grave responsibility to an inheritance. But why is there a responsibility? We don't like that word. We like to be irresponsible, you know, but there is a responsibility. Why? Because Christ had to die for you to receive it. We have to be a wise region in God's kingdom to steward the inheritance properly for maximum growth, production, and multiplication. God is big into those types of things. Look at Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply. God is always looking to exponentially exponentially grow something, increase. He's always looking to something to get more. It's about the person, the talent, the parable about the talent, uh, the one that got ten or five, and then the person that got one. They did, the ten produced something, the five produced something, the one was a cursed servant. Servant, a pastor I think preached on it, but the one, didn't, the one who got the one talent, which is a measure of money, didn't do anything with it. He, he just threw it into the ground. And he was cursed and he was called a wicked servant because he didn't do anything. He didn't produce anything with it. God is always looking for a return. He does not invest into emotionally and spiritually bankrupt enterprises. God commands us to leave an indelible mark i.e. legacy, in the present and future which reflects the character and heart of the one who willed us all his treasures, we are to mirror our heavenly benefactor. And now many times a will will dictate when certain monies will be dispersed to the heir. Now there may be age requirements for these things. Maybe by 20 or maybe by 18 they'll release some money for college. By 25 maybe some more monies would be released for you to purchase a house or something like that. In the Bible, it's a little bit different. A little kingdom theology is a little bit different. It's not really based upon chronicle or um, linear age per se. It's really based upon spiritual maturity. Your church attendance or lack thereof, spotty Bible reading, occasional prayer, if you feel like it tithing, and I don't really like to share my faith with others, will cause your inheritance to be exercised and enjoyed at a later point in time. And then you'll get angry at, at other people that are enjoying their inheritance and you'll be pitching a fit, but it's not really them, it's really you. Mature sons and daughters who have been tested, tried, who the Father can trust to make choices consistent with his character and heart will experience the satisfaction of walking in their inheritance. Now, I'm not talking about perfect sinlessness. I didn't say that. But the Bible says in Matthew 5.48, 
that God tells us to be perfect as he is perfect. The word perfect is the word teleos. Teleos means maturing, lacking nothing. That's what God wants. He wants maturity from us. God is not going to give us the keys to heaven's vaults to somebody who's a spoiled brat, who's wasteful and self-extravagant. Now, let's get practical. In the United Kingdom, which is England, as you've got, wait, you've got Great Britain, England, United Kingdom. It's like eight mile. You have baseline, vernier, eight mile road, baseline road. It's like 16 mile road. What, you know, it's got Big Beaver. Okay, I just thought about that. There's like three different names to the same place. Okay, anyhow, that was just for me. In the United Kingdom or England, there's a family group of close relatives of the monarch. Everybody knows about the royal family. I have no clue what these people do. It just seems they hang out jet set, and people give them a bunch of money. I don't know from high taxes, probably. Um, does anybody have a clue what they do? Okay, nobody has any clue, but they've got it like that. They've got money, and they've got all sorts of stuff. But anyhow, there's this guy named Prince Harry. Okay, He's the fourth in line to succeed Queen Elizabeth. Now, this gentleman, you might have seen him on like the grocery uh, magazine covers. He's kind of the clown. Uh, you know, he went to prestigious English schools, he served in the military, and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, he's kind of a drunk, kind of a womanizer, kind of that playboy, that type of thing. And the question is, why does somebody of royalty act like that? Because he doesn't know the importance of who he is and where he came from. He doesn't understand his name, his lineage, his birthright. He doesn't know his value, and that his name carries weight and privilege. His behavior isn't commensurate with his birthright. He doesn't know the excellence of his heritage. He doesn't fully understand what has been bestowed and conferred to him because of his family position. A lack of understanding your self-worth and who your father is can and will leave a stench, stain, or stigma upon the legacy of the family name. We carry the name of Christ. I think it was... Uh, my wife had ordered, we had ordered some uh, cartoon movies from The Voice of the Martyrs. Anybody know what The Voice of the Martyrs is? They help people, uh, brothers and sisters in chains across the world. But they have these movies. And they're cartoon movies about martyrs of the faith. And they have one on Richard Wumbrand. Richard Wumbrand is the founder of The Voice of the Martyrs. He was in the communist prisons back in the 50s, I believe. And the communists really didn't really treat Christians that well. Popular to the media. Um, he went through some horrible things. I think he was in jail for like... 14 years. But anyhow, the communists were taking over Romania, I believe. And um, they wanted, the government wanted to get with the religious leaders to kind of get them behind the idea of communism. Well, most of the religious leaders were falling in line with what the communist leaders had, uh, had to say. Uh, probably because if they didn't, they would probably end up, you know, probably like the people that ISIS don't like. You know, they would lose their head. But um, anyhow, his wife... Uh, Richard Rumbrand's wife, um, I, this woman, something else, she goes, you're bringing, if you don't stand up, Richard, you're going to bring shame and disgrace on the name of Christ. Knowing that if she said that to her husband, she was going to lose him. But she was so concerned about staining the name of Christ that she was willing to sacrifice her husband. Is our life, are we staining the name of Christ? Are we bringing disgrace to the name of Christ? I'm not trying to shame anybody, but healthy, self healthy, Holy Spirit-led self-examination is healthy. The Bible says, judge yourself, examine yourself to see if you're still in the faith. So I'm not here to condemn anybody, but to really look at it from that perspective is really interesting. Do we really want to stain the legacy of Christ? Or do we want to add something to it? What about us? Do we know, do we truly know what our birthright means? How are we stewarding the inheritance Christ gave us? Do we know the great honor and privilege and responsibility that comes with bearing his name? Is the legacy we're building built upon ourselves, our comfortability, self-pleasure, self-satisfaction, or are we leading an intentional life which leaves a more indelible internal mark? Those are questions that we'll have to ask ourselves. Now, that was just the introduction. Now we'll get to actually what we're going to be talking about today. Holy cow, that was a lot. It's a big intro. Four-page intro. God, I hope this guy speeded it up a little bit. 
Praise God, we've got plenty of time. Amen. There you go. Thank you, brother. I still got somebody excited to be here. We'll just go right into the overcomers at 3.30. Yeah. I'll be down at 3.15. Wow. Maybe we'll take up another offering or two. Praise God. Do some more worship, Brother John Paul. There you go. Anyhow, we'll be wrapped up in the next two hours, though. Seriously. Today, we'll be actually, we'll be uncovering and unwrapping, unwrapping, excuse me, further our inheritance. And then I prophetically speak, we will appropriate it to reflect the aggregate of the Father's traits to establish kingdom here on earth. As being a good Catholic, the Our Father, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is what we're supposed to be doing, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Amen. And we'll be putting our efforts towards leaving a legacy. Now, what are the hindrances of operating our inheritance, manifesting God's power and love, is that we do not have a transformed mind of Christ to really know the extent and the vastness of how large it really is. Now, for those people that like three points or four points in a conclusion, I will give that for you. Hallelujah. The number one greatest wealth in our inheritance, now get your mind off money, okay? This is bigger than uh, being the sole beneficiary of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Kennedy, and all that. It blows it away. The greatest inheritance we have is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, and I believe Pastor Chuck mentioned this uh, last week, John 17, 3. It's interesting about John 17. Jesus Christ, this is, as they call it the high priestly prayer. There's never one time in Scripture, and somebody can point it out to me if I'm wrong, but there's no time in Scripture that Jesus prayed that his prayer was not answered. Was there anyone? Was there a time his prayer was never answered? It was always answered. So if you read John 17, the culmination of John 17 is that as Jesus and the Father are one, that we would be one. Jesus' prayers are never unanswered. Oh, nobody's getting this. God will send the hounds of heaven and he will use the hounds of hell to get you to become one like him as he is like the Father. He will never, ever, ever give up on you. You can give up, you can choose to reject him, and you can do all that, but he is not going to give up on you. But John 17, 3, is it behind me? If it's not, okay, doesn't matter, I'm going to go with it. John 17, 3, the first greatest wealth our inheritance this is eternal life, that they may know you. The word know is the word gnosko. Gnosko is the Jewish idiomatic term of how a husband knows a wife. This is eternal life, that they may know you, that we may know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We're to know him at a deep and intimate level. That's our great reward and the pinnacle of the value of our inheritance. As my wife was preaching on the Song of Solomon, it's like this, from Song of Solomon 2.16 and 6.3, my beloved is mine and I am his. The idea that we are, his, is in, we are his inheritance. It's not that we, Christ is our inheritance, but did you know that we are his inheritance? I kind of feel bad for him a little bit sometimes. I think he's getting the raw end of the deal, the shaft, to be honest with you. You know. Anyhow. That's the essence of heaven on earth, relationship with our beloved. Now, in Bible hermeneutics, the study of Scripture, there's something called the law of first mention. I've mentioned this probably before. How something's presented to us in the Bible, it pretty much rem it remains consistent throughout the entirety of Scripture. Like, uh, man's born on the sixth day, so number six is of man. Six on the periodic table is actually carbon. We're a carbon-based life form. It's kind of interesting. But anyhow, so you have certain... Uh, you have um, certain things that just remain consistent, and that's called hermeneutics, but it's called the law of first mention. So anyhow, the first mention and presentation of relationship of God with man, Adam and Eve, is talking them face to face. That's how it's supposed to go. Okay, you're not understanding the gravity of what I just said. He walks, 
as he walked with them, Adam and Eve, and talked to them face to face. That's what is supposed to be with us. The Bible says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. Thank you. Say it again. They shall see God. See him, both literally and figuratively, in your mind's eye, in your imagination. But if we're not seeing him, really, whose fault really is that then? Are we pure in heart? Food for thought. Anyhow, that is number, number two facet of our inheritance, that we can, not only that Christ is ours, but we can have face-to-face -face intimate relationship with him. That's how it was supposed to be. And without understanding and fostering that relationship consistently, we cannot proceed to tap into a deeper level of our inheritance, which leads me to number three of our inheritance. John 14, 12. I have a difficult time with this scripture. It's difficult because um, if you really haven't tapped into the level that I say I expect, it's difficult to preach. Let's say you're preaching on the raising of dead. Okay? You've never raised anybody from the dead. It's, it's accessible. We can do it. It's for us. It's part of our inheritance. But it's difficult sometimes to preach something that you feel like you have not reached it in your estimation of your spirituality. Is that fair? Does anybody else ever feel that way? Okay. John 14, 12 states, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, talking about Christ, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So Jesus is saying we can do greater works. Uh, anybody kind of read the Bible? <laughs> greater works, that's... Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. I think I'm falling just a tad bit short, maybe, in the greater works. I had to think about that. <coughs> Actually, I, I had to, maybe I'll just throw this out here. I was talking to Pastor Chuck. We were working out at the gym. And um, I've always thought this about Jesus because uh, I think if Jesus was, Jesus was never married. So when people tell you on the Discovery Channel that uh, they found Jesus' wife, Jesus is not a Mormon and he's not a Muslim because he's married to the church. Okay, he already has a wife. Okay, he doesn't play with two wives and three wives. He already had a wife, so he had to be single. But I always thought Jesus would not be sinless if he had children. I've always thought this. I, I really did. I'm like, he would be screaming at them kids. Anyhow. You know what I'm saying? You'd think you'd just kind of, yeah. God, you think you'd just kind of lose it and be like, aha, got you, Jesus. But anyhow, um, so I was thinking about this. I'm like, well, what's a greater work that I've done than Jesus? And then I ponder this, and I, and I threw this out to him, and I'll throw it out to you. I'm not saying this is doctrine or theology or uh, correct theology. I said, you know what? Jesus didn't have an earthly wife, right? He didn't have an earthly wife, so he didn't have an earthly wife. He didn't consummate and produce children. So actually me producing children with my wife and discipling and mentoring my children for... 20, 25 years, whatever we have them at home, that would be considered I, a greater work. He mentored for three years 12 knuckleheads. Now, granted, that's very challenging. Don't get me wrong, but how about raising up three kids through 20, 25 years? I thought that'd be a greater work. So to parents, I'm throwing everybody a bone to make yourself feel better about yourself. I think because everybody, most everybody, quote, has children, they kind of devalue the importance and magnitude what it is to rear and raise children godly children. Anybody can breed children and armchair quarterback and scream and yell at them. I'm actually talking intentional parenting, raising them up in the fear and stature of the Lord. Amen. So anyhow, me and my wife have this saying, you have at least one child, you're a superhero. <laughs> and that's just how it goes. And if you don't have kids, um, okay, whatever. I mean, but I'm just saying, it's a different, it, different ballgame. I'm not trying to scare anybody from having kids, but to the single ones that are thinking about procuring the avenues in which to have kids, stay away from that stuff, because that makes it a little, anyhow, crazy. Did I say that good enough and edit it out if I, that wasn't politically correct? Anyhow. Now, we're, 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 I'm getting off track here. What were we talking about? Oh, Jesus, okay. But how do we get this greater thing? Now, I think we need to do a couple things. We need to remove the mysticism, claiming spiritual experiences are bad and of the devil, um, God is spirit. 
Okay, uh, the whole spirit realm was made by God. Satan perverted what God had made. So it's okay, with a couple caveats, which we'll get to. Remove the mysticism or using hyper wisdom, which really masquerades as fear. No, oh, I don't want a little spiritual experience. That's just weird and all that sort of stuff. And I'm just using wisdom and playing it safe. No, it's not playing it safe. Safe is playing you. Okay, that's what we're supposed to be doing. You're a you're not a human having a spiritual experience. You're a spirit having a human experience. If I could quote C.S. Lewis. Okay. Yeah. In human rationalism. We had talked on a couple, maybe three, four Sundays ago about the love of God, which is unreasonable, illogical, and irrational. The inheritance God left for us is manifested like his great love. What God gave us is incomprehensible. It's unimaginable. And it's something the world is dying to see. You have to play nice and share. Give what God gave you to others. But we have to first experience him on a daily basis. Then as a carrier of his presence, we openly reveal and we demonstrate it to others. Demonstrate it, not only in word and talk, but in power. Now there are certain denomination or is denominations that believe that certain offices or the power gifts of God have dried up and vanished since the early apostolic age. Once the apostles died off, somehow they all disappeared too. I don't know where they disappeared to. Maybe they should check the spiritual lost and found. But they say they've disappeared. Whatever. They believe God only speaks through the written word of God, the Logos, either because of fear, ignorance, and a lack of experience. They state, they state certain things do not exist anymore. And since the world revolves around their limited experience in theology, if they haven't had it, it means you haven't or it isn't real. However, let's be honest though. Are we really satisfied with the level of spiritual encounters that we have with God? We're probably a little bit dismayed. We're probably even a tad bit frustrated that we probably don't, you know, see something super duper scooby awesome. You know, maybe a little here and there, but it's not to the level that we would like. Or is it just me? And if you're satisfied with where you're at, then come lay hands on me. I'll take some of your anointing. Anyway. But there's a myriad of reasons why that happens, which we're not going to be getting into. But it's not because of God's lack of desire to communicate with his people. According to Romans 8.14, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. I'm also talking daughters of God. So validation of our sonship, if you will, is seen by our ability to not only access the supernatural, but walk in his leading and then introduce people to the true reality of God himself who is supernatural in his essence. That's our job. The false doctrine of these unnamed denominations which conveniently disposes parts of the word of God that they are uncomfortable with because of the lack of experience or fear is called cessationism. And it's based off 1 Corinthians 13, which we won't get into to dissect why their argument is no good. But cessationism Christianity will get you what you expect. If you don't expect much, then you won't get much. Cessationism is afraid because you can study a book and Jesus the man, but you can't comprehend and control the Christ. Lack of expectation, unbelief in the power of God risks nothing and is a self-fulfilling prophecy. People in this world are desiring something that is genuine, something that is real, something that is coated with love, something that is transcendent, something that is powerful in nature. We are called to be those people who openly display and exhibit the power and love of Christ. Bill Johnson from Bethel Church says this, We will no longer make up excuses for powerlessness because powerlessness is inexcusable. Our mandate is simple. Raise up a generation that can openly display the raw power of God. But if we're really honest and transparent with ourselves, how much effort are we really putting in with, in our relationship with God? Is it very spotty? Is it when we, have, we, we feel like we have time, if we feel like it, well, if God's doing good for us? Consistency will bring revelation and activation. Inconsistency gets little to no results, but frustration and a spiritually dimming and hardening to his heart and voice. Our level of expectation is birthed out of relationship with him. 
If you are tight with God, then you can and will expect great things because he, is dis- he desires to disclose these things to his people. Visitations, dream, revelation in the word, all these types of things. Okay, let's get a little practical. There's two realities to salvation. Everybody says, well, I got saved. Well, okay. First of all, you, or like people say, I found Jesus. First of all, Jesus wasn't lost. Okay, <laughs> number one, he didn't lost. Number two, you didn't find nothing. A.W. Tozer says that there's something called, you have grace. There's like common grace. You know, the Bible says that it rains upon the wicked and the just. There's a common grace that's available for everybody, sinner and saint alike. There's something called provenient grace, A.W. Tozer says. He says that we're so lost in sin that literally God has to, and I did this one time at our old church to Phil Holman, whoever remember Phil Holman. God will actually, he will strong arm you and almost like police tackle you and that's like provenient grace. It's a grace to almost to accept the grace of God. You didn't do it of your own accord. He had to strong arm you and take you to the ground like you're a criminal. Well, before Christ, we were a criminal. So there we go. That's provenient grace. Anyhow. So salvation is a continuing process. Philippians 2.12, I believe, says, you know, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So we're continuing being saved. But there's two aspects to it. There's the judicial, everybody say judicial, Judicial. and then there's the organic, organic. The judicial reality is a work that Jesus accomplished for us, and the the organic work is the work that Jesus did, how does it go? Through us, there we go. God's ultimate goal is not to do for us. God's ultimate goal is to work through us, okay? Okay. After we establish a right relationship with God, he changes us into his image from glory encounter to glory encounter. 2 Corinthians 3.18, I believe. Judicially, lawfully, we are received in the grace of God. Organically, we associate with the life of God. We learn to live supernatural lives. So to live organically is to live supernaturally. We interact with God. The goal of God's complete salvation, not just to get saved and I have a ticket to go to heaven, But his idea of complete salvation is not just forgiveness. Pastor Ostervain talked about there's three stages. You have the idea of, um, what is it, forgiveness, freedom, and fullness. Anybody remember that? But anyhow, I just remember stuff because it all has the same letter because it's like Baptist. Anyhow, so you have forgiveness. A lot of people like to hang on to the cross. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. Sit at Jesus' feet, I'm forgiven. But you don't move away from the cross into something more. Okay? But God's Complete salvation is to move from forgiveness, praise God for forgiveness, but you move to freedom in the fullness of receiving God's inheritance, walking in holiness, being a partaker of his divine nature, according to 2 Peter. We need not just to qualify for salvation, but we're to live organically. We're to live supernaturally, interacting with heaven and having that true reality meet and collide and explode here on earth to us and through us. It is not aligning ourselves with the correct creed or correct tenets of faith, but it's when the seed of God comes into your spirit, man, and we are living an elevated life commensurate with our birthright. We can't rationalize, reason, or minimize the greatness of who God is and the influence that we have, or the, inf- or the influence we have with him through inheritance and covenant. The thing is, we have influence with God. This is the amazing part about it. You know, um, he talks about man being like a maggot. Um, I think it was John G. Lake. He said he never really liked, you know, even though the Bible says that men is like maggots, that he always thought that was kind of a um, kind of a dis- condescending thing. He always looked at people, and if you don't know John G. Lake, his healing ministry was fantastic. And I, I'm a big, like, I think he was absolutely fantastic. But he said he always looked at people as kings and priests. So instead of looking at people as projects, look at them as people. Look at them as priests and kings, not maggots. Anyhow, but um, it's not aligning ourselves with tenets of faith, but it's we're living a life where we have influence of, of God or influence with God. You have Abraham who pleaded to, remember the angels that were visiting him and they wanted to go to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy that place. And he, stand, he stood in the gap and said, Lord, 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 if you can find this many righteous people, we destroy this many. And he went down, I think it was like 10 people or whatever. God is looking for those people that stand in the gap. And I'll throw myself under the bus. 
Sometimes, do you ever deal with people that you don't really want to deal with people, and um, maybe they exit stage left, let's say out of the church, and you're like, oh, that's so sad, but deep inside you're like, great, that's good. <laughs> but then the Lord convicted me of that, and uh, he said, well, hmm, that's not going to work. And I was like, great, okay. So there's Bible for this too. There's this guy named Moses. Moses they said was the most humble man on the earth. It's interesting that Moses wrote the first five books of the New Testament, so he actually wrote about himself being the most humble. You'd think that wouldn't be humble. <laughs> but anyhow, humble. It's interesting. What is the word humble? I, somebody gave a definition. They said humble is, is not, it's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I don't know. But anyhow, Moses, the spirit of Moses was he was willing to stand in the gap for rebellious, stiff-necked people. God said, you know what, I'll destroy these people and I'll make a great people out of you. And you know what he said? He said, no. But how many people, when, they walk, when people that you really don't care for, you don't like, they grind you, friction, that sort of crap, they exit and we're like, yes, praise God. Oh, well, maybe, you know, you could be a blessing to somebody else's ministry. <laughs> Whatever. But do we really have the spirit of Moses that says, you know, no, 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 Lord. I mean, if the Lord dismisses them and releases them, fantastic. Well, I'm not talking about that. But I believe that's so the Lord convicted me of that. He's like, mm, no, you're supposed to stand in the gap for the person. So, anyhow, I'll just let that one sit. <laughs> anyhow. But the thing is, which the, one of the main ingredients in friendship like Abraham was called the friend of God, is the ability to have sway or influence with somebody. We, have, we don't have influence to change God's sovereign plan, but we do have the ability to cooperate with him on what he wants to do here on earth. We need to know what our birthright means, spend time with God consistently practicing his presence. If I could quote Brother Lawrence from the, whatever the 17th century, that monk who hung out in the kitchen, having Jesus moments all the time. If you don't know what that means, just Yahoo it or Google it. And thereby enjoying and properly stewarding that part of our inheritance. And with that foundation being laid, God has a landing strip. God has, that's why that you, it's important to read the Bible, study the Bible, so God can stir something up and breathe on something. If there's nothing there, what can you really draw off of? So that's why we, we fill ourselves with the Word of God. We can use it as a landing strip or platform to build off of and then we can have greater supernatural experiences and affect people for Christ. But for everybody who's religious, which sometimes I struggle with this myself, what do we do in practical terms? This is a lot of talking and a lot of stuff, but what do we do in practical terms? Does everybody like practical theology? The supernatural stuff is fantastic. Sometimes we have to get very practical, though. We have to turn our hearts and minds' affections towards God commanding our unruly and undisciplined minds to be submissive to the Spirit. Now, if I asked everybody just to sit and spend quiet time with God for 15 minutes, people would go mad. They would drive their heads into the drywall. They couldn't do it. They'd be thinking about, you know, where we're going to eat, what we're doing. We can keep our minds focused for about, what, 12 seconds? Maybe. And the ADD folks, it's like two seconds. The soul doesn't rule you. The Spirit the soul, mind, will, and emotions, but your spirit man is supposed to have dominion over that. <clears throat> we have to focus our thought life towards heaven and not to just the laundry list of earthly items on our to-do list. So first then we wait and we expect for God to speak because God still speaks. Amen. Okay? So we have expectation, then visitation, which produces revelation, and then activation. Yes. Have we got that? Yes. Expectation, visitation, we get a revelation, and then activation. Okay? I had to try to find everything that's T-I-O-N, that kind of rhymes. But this is a process. Like I said, you maybe only do it for a few seconds at first to a few minutes, but as you discipline your body through working out, I didn't say if you were working out, Anyhow, I'll, somebody probably caught that. So as you discipline your body through working out, you discipline your mind to focus on things above, the things that are invisible, not the things that are seen in this world that is perishing away. Use your imagination. I didn't say fantasize about the things you want. I told Pastor Chuck this. 
If we are made in the image and likeness of God, okay, so you have the word image, okay, where do images come from? An imagination. So God used his imagination to, in his mind, he thought about us, and then we were created out of that image. We're made in his image and likeness, okay? Every great creation, every creator, imagines so Mr. Scheibner, if you're a great creator of something, you have to imagine it in your head. In your mind's eye, you have to see how things are going to operate, function, put together. So we have to use a sanctified imagination. We have to call our mind into order. That's why uh, Joyce Meyer's The Battlefield for the Mind book. It's always about the mind. You know, that's why the Bible says have transformed renewing of your mind. So we have to discipline our mind. So as we habitually make this our spiritual maintenance program, with God, not getting an oil change once every 15,000 miles like my wife used to do in her old Toyota Paseo, but doing it every three to 5,000 miles as the manufacturers recommend, which is probably, I think, a little less. Bam. And so as we make this our maintenance program with God, we can then move into greater experiences with Him that not only validates our corporate faith system, Christianity, but expands our faith individually. If you get something from God or God speaks to you about something, that actually may encourage you. You might be like, oh, wow, that was kind of cool and kind of neat. Then you'll go revisit and do that again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Once you taste, taste and see that the Lord is good, if you taste and see actually something that he gives you, you're like, holy smoke, then you want to dip into those waters again. Now, there's something called reason of use. It basically means if you have been, been there once, spiritually speaking, you have access to it again. It's a lot easier after the first time of doing something. Okay? The first time is usually the trickiest. It's like the first million. first million is the toughest. After that, it's a lot easier for the second million. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so it's called reason of use. So if you've pressed in with God and you had an encounter with him, then it is easier to position and posture yourself to have it again. The renewed man reflects the reality of the kingdom of God and a, and a bridge is established where you interact and walk in two realms. This is where it gets weird. Like the Bible says that we're seating in heavenly places. Well, we're down here, but how are we seating in heavenly places? Pull this verse up. Where was our sound booth going here? Are you leaving? You have to use the bathroom? Okay. It's not working? Oh my gosh. You've got to read this. Somebody could pull out their Bible. First, you got, this verse is so weird, it makes no sense. 1 John 4.17b. And whoever has it, just raise your hand. And then stand up and with the voice of Alexander Scorby, enunciate it correctly. Uh, I see that hand back there. Go ahead, brother. Uh, yeah, 1 John 4.17, the last, just read the whole thing. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may... Have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Okay, no, no, just say that last part. So as he, say that again. Because as he is, so are we in this. Okay, world. hold on there. Because as he is, yes. So are we. Yep. So as Christ is now, so are we. That's weird. Yep. How is that possible? What is Christ doing right now? Are you doing all sorts of crazy stuff? He's up in heaven. He's on a supernatural adventure of his lifetime. So we're actually seated, we're, we're multidimensional creatures, if you will. We're seated in heavenly places, but we're in this temporal plane. As Jesus is in the divine, so are we. It's really mind-bending, but anyhow. When we receive dreams, revelations, etc., obviously we've got to read, or we've got to make sure, first and foremost, it makes sense with the word of God. God is not going to go against his word. So if you get a revelation or something and you can't find any uh, backing in the word of God uh, or you, know, you speak with somebody who's maybe mature in the faith that knows the word and it's not making sense or something like that, we want to make sure things are consistent. God's not going to go against his word of God. If somebody says, I've got new revelation and you know, an angel gave it to me, uh, probably not a good idea. Okay, you can talk to Muhammad about that and Joseph Smith. So that's not really good. Anyhow, anybody tells you they had an angelic visitation and I'm the new prophet, I'm going to add on to the finished work of Christ, don't just kind of, oh, praise God, I'll pray for you. And then just walk <laughs> away. Now invite him to church, fine. Uh, just do that. Just put him in the back though. Just kidding, just kidding. All right. Remember, the man with the experience is never at the mercy with the man with the theology. 
You have, to, you have to think about that. The man with the experience is never at the mercy of the man of the theology. You can have somebody who preaches Bible and all, and I know the Bible and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I want somebody who's been there, who's yeah. done it, who's yeah. got the t-shirt, now back at the ranch. Okay, you can tell me all about, me and my wife went to the Virgin Islands. Okay, you can read books about it. You can do all that sort of stuff. We can tell you what it's actually like, what the water's like, the sand's like, the, the lizards that crawl around and those fruity drinks and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so you can never, there's something to be said about the experience as opposed to having just written book knowledge about something. Yeah. Amen? Okay. Now let's go a little bit deeper before we, we're gonna be closing up shop here momentarily. Let's go a little deeper and we'll see, we'll look at another facet of our inheritance in Christ. Now there's several instances of portals and doorways in the Bible. Genesis 28 talks about Jacob. He says that, you know, the angels descending, he says that there's actually, uh, this is nothing but the gateway to heaven. You have in Malachi 3, where when you offer your tithes and offerings, God will open up the windows of heaven. You have John, you have Revelations 4, where John the Apostle is up in heaven and it says, hey, I'm standing before a door. So there's doors, portals, there's entrance and gateways in heaven that we have access to. That's part of our inheritance, okay? Now, what are important about these access ways and portals? Well, again, this is part of our inheritance, and we'll see how important this is in a moment. There is a divider between this realm, the natural realm, which we live in, and the supernatural. You know we have the equator on a globe? Um, and uh, you have the, uh, the equator that separates the southern and the northern hemispheres. It's the same thing spiritually speaking. You have a divider, if you will, that separates the eternal from the natural. Does everybody understand that? You can't just go to heaven. Uh, go ahead. Take a plane there. Uh, uh, see you around. I mean, you're, you can't do it that way. There's a divider, and the Bible actually calls it a fabric or a tent or a curtain. And uh, since there's this sound booth, it's not working. It's in Isaiah 40:22. Psalm 104.2, if you're interested to see that I'm not speaking heresy. But there is actually something that separates us from the eternal, from the supernatural. Okay? <clears throat> as I said before, as a child of God, you have the ability to access, as a part of our inheritance, this eternal realm. Now, we understand in the eternal realm, there is something called everything. There's no sickness, there's no economic downturn, there's prosperity, there's health, there's wisdom, there's everything that we need accessible in heaven. We just have to get it from point A to point B. Right? That makes sense? Okay. So we're going to try to figure out how we get it from point A to point B. So we have a divider of fabric that separates us from the fourth dimensional reality, the true reality. And so we want to make sure that this is um, biblical that we have to see how Jesus... Now, Jesus, we're supposed to follow Jesus' example. So we have to look in the Bible. Are there any examples of Jesus accessing supernatural power from heaven that we can actually see that there was a incision or a puncture or something in the divider between the eternal and the temporal? Okay, There should be something that Jesus... Did because if we're supposed to represent Jesus, do the things he did, then there should be an instance of this, correct? All right, let's go to uh, Matthew 3 14 through 16. So it's not working at all. All right, you just draw it up there, get a ladder, the one that Jim had, and with a crayon, put it up there. No, we can't do that either. Okay, praise God. People can't count on you, Sarah. They actually have to do it themselves. <laughs> I know. It's tough coming to church. Matthew three fourteen through 16, if you were there, please say, oh my. Wow, two people. But John forbade them, this is talking about John the Baptist, him saying, uh, forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou unto me. This is where Jesus was getting baptized by John. John's like, hold up, you should be baptizing me. But Jesus is like, no, it's okay. So Jesus said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. There's a lot of suffering going on. It's interesting. And Jesus, when he was baptized, watch what happened when he was baptized. So Jesus was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened. So something opened up. 
And the Spirit of God descended on him. So the heavens opened up and the Spirit of God from the Eternal came onto Jesus in this temporal place. Does that make sense? That's biblical. Okay. So the heavens were opened up and the divider between the two realms was pierced and the Spirit of God met with Jesus, the God-man. Why was this important and why is this important for us to have supernatural encounters where we actually have heaven open up for us? Why is this important? Because if Jesus needed these experiences for his ministry, how much more so do we? Unless you got it more like Jesus, then again, uh, you can lay hands on me. So if he needed it, we need it. Matthew 27, 50 to 51, just so we make sure that we have another proof. Matthew 27, 50 to 51, while you're going there, I will read it. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil, the curtain, the fabric of the temple was rent in twain from the top, heaven, bottom, earth. Uh, okay. It was torn. The divider was torn. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks rent. Jesus cried out, and the curtain, the veil of the temple, was torn from top, representing heaven to earth. This breakthrough of the divine into the natural was so powerful that the earth quaked and rocks split. That's power. Does anybody need power like that? That's what I'm saying. This is what you have access to in your inheritance. You have power from on high. Now, there's a final few things that I think this is, this is so cool. I just think this is so cool. I think God is just awesome. He's just really like neat. It was Dr. Costa. He said God is like, he's so God. You know what I mean? He's so God. He just does like crazy stuff and it's like, that's really neat. Anyhow, one more thing and then we'll be bringing it. Maybe you could put something apropos on in the next whatever time period you feel led to. You ever thought about some of the miracles, some of the crazy stuff in the Bible? Like the Red Sea, passing over the River Jordan, Dan, or excuse me, the Hebrew boys in the furnace. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, oh yeah, Joshua killing the kings, the sun standing still and he's slaughtering them and hacking people and all that sort of stuff. And you're like, my God, these are like, are these like biblical fairy tales? Or are these actually real things, not only historically speaking, but can we actually expect to have these types of things in our own life? The Bible says that we can. Just because you haven't, or maybe I even had the sun stand still. The sun doesn't really stand still. The planets actually stood still. And they stopped in their orbit because the sun is fixed. Everybody knows? Okay. But anyhow. But you can. You have access to that type of power if you're covenantly bound with Christ. That's so wild. I don't know if that makes anybody, stirs anybody up, man. But it should stir you up for a hunger for the supernatural, for God Almighty. I'm not just saying for his hands, but I'm saying for his heart. When you have, when you minister to the heart of God, his hands is part of the deal. He's not some chopped up body with a torso. You go after his heart and you'll have his hands. His hands that manifest power. Because if you're just going after the hands, I mentioned this before, if you're just going after the hands, what they can do for you, that's called professional intimacy. And we, we know what we call people that do... We don't have any young people. Well, yeah, we kind of, hopefully that just went over them. What do you call professional people that are intimate for a living? Praise the Lord. These are not fairy tales thousands of years ago, but we can have these to these degree as well. This is interesting. Exodus 3, 2. But these are, I'm just going to try to read this very, very quickly. There's a word in the Bible. And actually, I'm taking this from Katie Sosa. This was fantastic. I pulled this up on my lexicon. Because you always have to check people. You know, make sure, they're, make sure their stuff's right. You know, I don't, just because it's on the internet or whatever, that doesn't mean anything. You know what I'm saying? Somebody said, yeah, the, the earth or, or the, you know, the moon's made of green cheese. Oh, the earth's made of green, it's made of green, green cheese. But she did this thing where it's called in the midst. If you look throughout scripture, you'll see this phraseology. It's called in the midst. 
Watch this. This is, this is fantastic. Exodus 3.2. This is about the burning bush. So Moses, doing his thing, goes to, he's like, hey, my gosh, I better go to this burning bush. It's on fire, but it's not really on fire. But it is on fire, but it's not getting consumed. Whatever. So he goes, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called, a, called a, him to Moses out of the midst of the bush. Okay, Joshua 3.17. This is the story of Joshua leading the children of Israel across the river Jordan. It says, and the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on the dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. I'm going I'm to sum this stuff up, so don't worry about it. Joshua 10.13, about the sun standing still. Joshua's fighting demonic kings. He's slaughtering them. And the sun stands still. And it says, so the sun stands still in the midst of heaven. Last one. We'll go New Testament. Luke 4.29. This is the part where Jesus was, uh, he declared himself to be God. And the Jewish leaders uh, didn't really care for that, so they tried to kill him. That's not really cool. That's a bad day. As my daughter says, worst day ever. So that's worst day ever. They're trying to throw you off a hill. So anyhow, so they're trying to so they're trying to take Jesus and like throw him off you know a cliff. That's not cool. But anyhow, Luke four thirty says, but he Jesus passed through the midst. So what in the heck is the midst? The phrase in the midst means to sever, to go into and through. Okay, sever, go into and through. Play that music. When God is in your midst, he rips back the divider of space and time and brings heaven to earth. When heaven meets earth, when the superior and everlasting meets the temporal and finite, there is an explosion. There is the miraculous. There is the extraordinary. You and me have access to the God of heaven and earth. And all that he has He will puncture the fabric of time to bring deliverance, salvation, and He will provoke you to say, wow. In the midst, God met with a man named Moses and raised up one of of the greatest deliverers in all of history. In the midst, God will provide you a route of passage from your enemies. In the midst, your enemies are routed by floodwaters from heaven that you will pass through unharmed. In the midst, your river of Jordan experiences will mean obstacles are removed while the waters stand in heaps as you walk to your promised land. In the midst means that planets stop their rotation. In the midst means you can translate out of harm's way, walking away unscathed from those people, those dogs, those enemies that want to hurt you. In the midst is where you stand in a furnace and you come out not smelling like smoke but the fragrance of heaven. Hallelujah. And I'm out of breath. Come on, praise him, church. In the midst is there's power. Woo, Jesus. Woo, he's strong. Ah. Woo. Ah, He's strong. My daughter says, man, are you as big as Goliath? I said, you know know what? I wasn't as big as Goliath, but God's a lot bigger than Goliath. Woo. He's not. He's big. Anyhow. We'll close up now. Real quick, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. But I want to have some time of prayer for those that want to come forward that God will sever and puncture the fabric of time and come in the midst of your situations. So if that rings a chord inside of you, you can come forward. To some others, this is, this is so radical. Uh, I asked the Lord uh, many times to see if Maybe you would want to check this. But we're actually going to spend quiet time focusing on Jesus. You know, this is a radical experiment. Like, maybe five or ten minutes. Quiet time with Jesus. And that doesn't mean asking him for a bunch of stuff. Quiet time for God, where you actually focus on him. And then maybe you'll get, wow, if your level of expectation is such, a word, a vision, something, We use our sanctified imagination which produces illumination, bringing revelation, and then activation. Okay? So for the people who have come forward, praise God, we'll pray. I'll pray. But for other folks, just sit, chill, relax, focus on Jesus.